Hello and welcome to our fresh new episode of Science Monitor, our weekly update on all that is happening in the field of science and technology in and around the country. From Mangalyaan completing one year in space to the most recent animation of Pluto by NASA, we have many exciting stories in store for you today. But let us begin with the headlines. Mangalyaan successfully completes one year in mass orbit. The mission will continue. NASA's new animation brings the Pluto's beauty live on screen. Science Setu workshop in Delhi, bridging the gap between students and research. A second time infection by dengue can be fatal, warns new study. And in our In Focus segment today, we trace the history of human evolution. And now the news in detail. 24th September 2014 marked a golden letter day in the history of Indian science. For it was on this day that India's Mangalyaan successfully reached its destination Mars, following an arduous journey and overcoming many obstacles. Now hailed as one of the most innovative venture that will change the world, Mangalyaan since then has been collecting crucial information that furthers our understanding of the Red Planet. As the mission successfully completed one year in space, it is indeed a time to celebrate. It is indeed a proud moment for the entire nation, as India's Mangalyaan successfully completed one year in space on 24th September. Hailed as world's first Mars mission to succeed Mars orbit insertion in its first attempt. The Mars Orbiter mission, fondly known as Mangalyaan, reached the Red Planet on 24th September 2014 after overcoming many obstacles during its one-year journey. While the planned lifespan of Mangalyaan after its insertion into Mars orbit was six months, which completed on 24th March 2015, with ample propellant reserves and satisfactory health parameters of all critical systems of the satellite, its life was extended for six more months. Since its insertion into Martian orbit, Mangalyaan has been capturing images and collecting data, enabling researchers further their understanding about Mars. MOM's Mars Color Camera has so far captured hundreds of spectacular pictures of the surface of Mars, including full-disc image of Mars, mountains, dead volcanoes and dust storm activities on the planet. Mangalyaan has also managed to capture one of the first global images with details of the atmospheric movement in the northern hemisphere of Mars. The camera has successfully captured the close-up of various impact craters on the surface of Mars, Velis Marineris, a system of canyons on Mars and the Martian satellite Phobos. The special instruments on board Mangalyaan continues to conduct various experiments to study the Martian surface. These experiments include analysis of the mineral composition of Martian soil and its atmosphere for methane gas, while the methane sensor for Mars has been measuring the natural gas in the Martian atmosphere and mapping its sources. The Lyman Alpha Photometer is studying the atmospheric process of Mars and measure the deuterium and hydrogen ratio and neutral particles in its upper atmosphere. Mangalyaan's Mars Exopheric Neutral Composition Analyzer and Thermal Infrared Imaging Spectrometer has been gathering data and analyzing the composition of Mars and measuring the day and night temperatures to map the surface composition and mineralogy of Mars. With the tracking of MOM showing that the orbiter still has nearly 40 kg fuel remaining, it is expected that the space probe will continue to function for significant amount of time, thus enhancing the planetary science data. Despite the advanced curricula and modern disciplines, it is not often that young students get a chance to interact with the scientists working in core research. Now, bridging this gap between college education and scientific research, NII, in collaboration with Colleges of Delhi, organized a Science Setu workshop in the capital recently. The workshop saw enthusiastic participation of hundreds of students who interacted with prominent researchers attending the workshop. 
We live in a knowledge driven society which demands continuous updation and application of new knowledge. Accordingly, educational courses and curriculum has undergone major transformations to cater to the needs of students and society. Despite these advancements, there still exists a gap between institutional research and higher education, and Science Setu comes as an answer. Launched by the National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, in association with undergraduate colleges of the University of Delhi, Science Setu, as the name indicates, aims to act as a bridge between researchers and students. Under this novel program, researchers of NII interact with the students and teachers of the colleges for at least 12 hours each academic year in the form of lectures, lab work, workshops and mentorship of vacation projects. While the inauguration lectures of the Science Setu program was given by Professor K. Vinay Raghavan, Secretary DBT, and Professor Raghavendra Gadagkar, Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore, in last year March, Researchers have followed up with more talks this year. This year's Science Setu program was focused on a workshop entitled On Stem Cell Science and Technology, Hype and Reality. The Science Setu is a program which is designed to connect research institutions in this country with undergraduate or other teaching institutions in the country. See, what happens is in research institutions there is not enough teaching except for pre-PhD courses. In academic institutions such as our colleges there is not enough research. So there is a disconnect between research and teaching in this country. In order to bridge this, we have designed this program called Science Setu. The program was held on 22nd of September at the Salman Ghani Hashmi Auditorium Zakir Hussain Delhi College. The workshop inaugurated by former secretary DBT, Dr. Manju Sharma, and attended by about 400 students from 12 partner colleges, comprised the keynote lecture by pioneering stem cell researcher Dr. D. Balasubramaniam, director of research L. V. Prasad I Institute, Hyderabad, on cells, stem cells and their applications. It was a very informative seminar in the sense that it didn't give all the hype and all the all the myths that are related to stem cells. It didn't sensationalize the topic. It gave it to us as basic science, which it already is. And the upside of the what what this program did for me was that it inspired me and it sort of it told me where we stand on this topic right now, and it told me what all I can do as a young as as somebody who wants to work in research, what I can do to move this topic forward. The talk was followed by a panel discussion among experts on various aspects of stem cell science and application. The panel discussion was attended by other pioneering researchers like Dr. Ashok Mukhopadhyay, National Institute of Immunology, Dr. Sujata Mohanty, All India Institute of Medical Sciences and Dr. Alka Sharma, Department of Biotechnology. With the doctors reporting the largest outbreak of dengue since 2010 in the country, the fear of the vector-borne disease continues as more and more cases of dengue were reported during the past few weeks. Now, amidst this uh, comes a new revelation. Now, scientists have warned that a second-time infection by dengue can prove fatal. The warning comes from a study on the infective properties of the virus, which shows that each strain is unique and different, and sometimes they also overlap genetically which means that one vaccine for one strain may not work in some cases. More in this report. While experts till now believe that four genetically distinct types of deadly dengue virus existed, new studies indicate crucial information regarding the evolution of dengue virus. The study based on 47 strains of dengue virus with 148 samples taken from both humans and primates to check whether they indeed fit into four distinct types indicates overlap among the four dengue types. According to the new study, while the dengue viruses are grouped around the four genetically distinct types, these antigenic properties are used by the body's immune system to recognize and respond to the virus. 
The study implies that due to the variations between the strains in the same group, an individual infected with one type may not be immune against antigenically different viruses of the same type. This also indicates that while the first dengue infection may be often mild, in many cases the second infection by dengue virus can be severe and life-threatening. Based on these observations, scientists also hypothesize that antibodies produced in response to infection with one strain of the dengue virus may somehow be allowing viruses of a different strain to enter undetected into cells. The study sheds important light on the evolution of dengue virus and will affect the way vaccines are being designed for the virus. The study has been published in the journal Science and has implications in determining which strain will be included in vaccination programs in future. We all have seen its images, but Pluto, the most distant planet in our solar system, will now come alive on our screens with NASA's new animation. The animation has been created from thousands of pictures captured by NASA's New Horizons spacecraft and aims to bring new information on Pluto to the public. Let us see in this report. Pluto, the farthest and one of the smallest planets in the solar system. Considered a fossil remain from the beginning of solar system, much about Pluto remained a mystery, at least till NASA's New Horizons reached it. With jagged mountains and deep craters, Pluto indeed is very beautiful, according to researchers. Sharing this beauty and knowledge with the public, NASA has recently released an animation of a flyover of Pluto. The animation has been created by Dr. Stuart Robbins at the Southwest Research Institute, Boulder, using hundreds of images captured by the long-range reconnaissance imager of the New Horizons spacecraft during its mid-July flyby. The animation starts with the images of Norgay Mons, the jagged mountains of Pluto, named after mountaineer Tenzing Norgay, one of the first climbers to reach Mount Everest. The animation also shows the contrast and brightness of Sputnik Planum and Kulu region, which are some of the largest natural brightness variations of any object in the solar system, scripting a new chapter in space exploration. The animation also shows the contrast and brightness of Sputnik Planum and Kulu region, which are some of the largest natural brightness variations of any object in the solar system scripting a new chapter in space exploration. The animation and images captured by New Horizons has furthered the understanding about the distant Pluto planet. And now it is time to take a short break. We'll be right back. Keep watching Science Monitor. Welcome back after the break, you're watching Science Monitor. Let us now have a look at some important science and technology activities happening in India and abroad in our next segment, Science Express. The Gir Forest National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary, situated in Gujarat, which is a home to Asiatic lions, celebrated 50 years of its establishment on 18 September. Marking the occasion, a two-day seminar was conducted in Rajkot city to celebrate the successful conservation efforts of the sanctuary, during which a special postal stamp was also launched. The event was attended by the Tribal and Environment and Forest Minister of Gujarat, Mangubhai Patel. Owing to the intense efforts of the sanctuary officials today, Asiatic lion have moved from the list of critically endangered species to endangered species. In a rare medical feat, 
Doctors of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Jodhpur, have successfully separated conjoined male twins who shared a liver. The procedure was completed following a 10-hour marathon surgery involving a team of 40 doctors. तो सारे इन्वेस्टिगेशंस होने के बाद फिर हम लोग को भी अपनी टीम्स बनाई गई टीम्स ने पूरी रिहर्सल की कि किस तरह से कौन-कौन से स्टेप्स किए जाएंगे किस तरह से किया जाएंगे कौन किस टीम में होगा कौन एक एक बार सेपरेशन का कौन एक बेबी को देखेगा कौन दूसरी बेबी को देखेगा तो ये सारी प्रिपरेशंस हमारे को करीब 20 20 21 दिन लग गए उस प्रिपरेशन में the case of conjoined twins sharing liver surviving delivery is extremely rare and the surgery is hence hailed as an achievement according to sources the operation was carried out after intense study and preparation for almost a month the surgery was done free of cost valentina tereshkova the first woman to travel into space on this september 17th launched cosmonauts births of the space age the greatest exhibition of Soviet spacecraft and artifacts outside the country in London. The exhibition, which is being organized by the London Science Museum, lasts till 13th March 2016. I think that this exhibition shows и на Земле, и в космосе работают, а с другой стороны дает возможность подумать о дальнейшем сотрудничестве наших ученых, наших молодых людей, кто хочет полететь в космос. Так что я рада и считаю, что это очень важно, проведение подобной выставки в Лондоне, в прекрасном городе. The exhibition has many attractions including the actual Vostok 6 craft which carried Tereshkova into space in 1963 along with the 5 meter tall LK3 lunar lander from 1969 the most complete lunar lander still in existence also exhibited are the engineering models of a dog ejector seat and suit as used on Soviet suborbital rockets flights and the short lived space shard used on the Mir space station in a step towards the quality of exported flowers, Dr. Raja Durai from the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University has designed first of its kind flower fragrance testing device to assess the quality of flowers. The device which is a handheld electronic nose comes with powerful sensors which can absorb and analyze the fragrance of cultivated jasmine flowers based on an aroma index. The analysis which requires less than a minute and less than 10 grams of fresh flowers not only cuts down costs of flower analysis in laboratories but also increases the scope of farmers getting better prices for their products. In a rare celestial event that is happening for the first time in 30 years, people across the world will witness a supermoon in combination with the total lunar eclipse on 27 September. The day also marks the closest full moon of the year. According to experts, while the supermoon will be visible after nightfall, the Earth's shadow will begin to dim the supermoon slightly. Beginning at 8.11 p.m. EDT, that is 5.41 a.m. IST on 28 September, the total eclipse will last an hour and 12 minutes and will be visible to North and South America, Europe, Africa and parts of West Asia and the Eastern Pacific. humans originate? This question is perhaps one of the longest standing dilemmas faced by the man. From body structure to lifestyle to food habits, human beings have undergone many evolutionary changes over the millennia. Even today, scientists are working all over the world to, to trace human evolution using fossil evidences. Now, they have succeeded to some extent, but some missing links still need to be excavated in order to formulate a completely logical and universally acceptable theory of human evolution. And now, with a team of experts having discovered the fossils of Homo naledi from the Rising Star Cave in Africa, the interest in the subject has deepened worldwide. So we'll try to trace the evolutionary journey of humans in our today's In Focus.
If one was to trace the phylogeny of human evolution, it would date back to 65 million years ago, when a group of organisms called prosimians, the ancient primates, roamed the earth. According to fossil evidences, these prosimians evolved to become monkeys about 40 million years ago, from which arose the prehistoric apes about 30 to 20 million years ago, which later developed into modern apes, that is the present-day chimpanzees and gorillas about 17 to 4 million years ago. Australopithecus Austral means southern. These ancestors must have lived on Earth about 4.4 to 2.5 million years ago, as per the fossils found in Africa. Many species of Australopithecus has been described. They were the first hominids who walked upright, weighed around 40 kgs and were about 1.2 to 1.10 meters tall. The fossil of Lucy found in Ethiopia belongs to Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy possessed a small skull and ape-like features with low forehead, flat nose, no chin, but jutting jaws with massive teeth. Lucy had a brain that was one-third that of modern humans, was 1.1 meters tall and weighed 30 kgs. It is believed that individuals of this group might have used crude tools of wood and stone to scavenge meat. Another important link is the Australopithecus Africanus fossil called Taung Child, dated 2 to 1 million years ago. They had a brain smaller than that of Homo erectus but walked upright with large teeth shaped like those of a human. Another Australopithecus species were Australopithecus robustus and last were the Australopithecus bozai which lived around 1.8 million years ago and were nut tracker humans. Then came the first humans. Homo habilis Homo means human and habilis means able. The fossils were found in eastern and southern Africa and believed to be 2 to 1.5 million years old. They had a slightly larger brain case and smaller face and teeth than in Australopithecus, but it still retained some ape-like features, including long arms and a moderately prognathic face. They created and used stone tools and had more sophisticated speech and may have built first shelters. Homo erectus The upright human which lived 1.6 million to 2 lakh years ago. It is believed that they left Africa and spread throughout Asia and Europe. They had protruding jaw, no chin, thick brow ridges and a long skull. They had teeth smaller than in habilis but much larger brain than habilis may have had advanced speech, controlled fire and made more sophisticated tools than predecessors. Homo sapiens Sapiens means thinking. Fossils found across the world, especially in Africa, suggest that they lived 4 lakh to 40,000 years ago. They were the first wise of thinking humans. The fossils found in Shanidar cave, North Iraq, suggest that they buried their dead. The earliest Homo sapiens were the Neanderthals. Surprisingly, the most recently discovered Homo naledi from the Rising Star Cave of Johannesburg displayed behavior that has thus far only been seen in humans and Neanderthals. The fossils indicate that the living species must have been 1.45 to 1.5 meters tall, very skinny, had powerful joint muscles and had a brain about the size of human fist. They also show small, modern-looking teeth, human-like feet, but more primitive fingers and a small brain case. Homo sapiens sapiens are the present human beings which might have come into being 40,000 years ago. They were very wise, excellent hunters, using sophisticated weapons and had a control over their environment. They were the first to develop art as depicted in cave paintings and Venus figures. The earliest Homo sapiens sapienses were called the Cro-Magnons. Well, that is all for this episode of Science Monitor. Do tell us how to like our program. 
You can send your feedback and suggestions to us. Our email ID is news at vigyanprasar.gov.in. You can also write into us at vigyanprasar C24, Kutub Institutional Area, New Delhi 110016. Well, that is all for today, but we'll be back with fresh new stories on science and technology again next week. Till then, keep watching Rajasabha TV. Ta-ta.